Okay, I think we're, we're ready to go about now, so um, if everyone can take their seats, that would be really great. So Dr. Pablo Arenas is going to introduce, um, welcome you to the conference, the president of, the, of Texas A&M International University. Good evening. Um, let me welcome you all to uh, the, uh, I don't know, 38th, is it 38th annual or 30 26. something, huh? 26. 26, I thought we were farther along than that the 26th annual Western Hemispheric Trade Conference. Um, this, is, uh, this is a conference that's been going on, which I said, for 26 years, but it's been an outstanding conference. We pull in people from across the world to this conference. Um, it's, and so you'll have an opportunity over the next two and a half days to listen to some really outstanding speakers, including tonight's speaker. And I hope that all of you that will, will, will attend uh, the conference over the next two days. I'm really interested in the speaker tomorrow at lunch, who's going to talk about the cost of higher education. Um, he, he and I may have different different opinions uh, about the co about about the reasons for the cost of higher education, but that's we'll see. Um, but uh, anyway, and, and those of you who have not been on our campus, I hope you have the opportunity over the next couple of days to uh, go out and, and take and walk around the campus. It's a beautiful campus. Um, I always say we have a lot of wildlife on campus, uh, and it's not in the dorms, and it's not people drinking. Um, it really is deer and, and javelina and, and raccoons and skunks and a few other a few other assorted critters that we have wandering around the campus. Uh, so please avail yourself of the campus. Um, and uh, but uh, also tonight is of course we always kick off this event uh, with the I think the last usually the last in the in the IBC. Commerce Bank speaker series, and so I, we will do that tonight. And I will turn that back to George so that he can introduce our speaker tonight. Thank you very much, Dr. Rennes. <laughs> so, good afternoon. Welcome to the fourth lecture in the IBC Bank and IB, IBC Bank and Commerce Bank keynote speaker series for 2021 and 2022. I'm George Clark. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Western Hemispheric Trade in TAMIU's A.R. Sanchez School of Business. Our center, together with um, IBC Bank and Commerce Bank, brings speakers um, to speak about topics in the areas of international trade, international economics, finance, demography, and immigration. So before introducing today's speaker, I'd like to thank our sponsors um, for supporting the event, IBC and Commerce Bank. With their support, we've been able to bring many thought-provoking speakers over the years to Tammy Yu and to Laredo. I also want to do a little bit of housekeeping for the students. Um, so at, at the end of um, Mr. Marzak's um, presentation, there'll be a question and answer session. And we'll take questions from the audience who are here in person, but we also have a sizable audience um, of people online. And what um, and we want them to be able to ask questions too. So for those who are in, in attendance, please just raise your hand, and one of our excellent student workers will bring you a microphone so that you can ask the question and everyone can hear you. Um, if you're online, um, if you can type your question into the Q and A session, um, I will I will um, ask those questions to Dr. Marzak on on your behalf. Um, I, I will read them out. So um, we'll try to address as many questions as we can in the allotted time. Um, for students attending in person and on behalf of one of your classes, you should have had your student ID scanned at the door. In addition, you are provided with a QR code that will take you to an online form that you will submit your class information. Finally, you'll scan your ID when departing once the lecture's ended. For those students attending online, your class information should have been submitted during the registration process. Okay, so now we've done that, I would like to introduce our speaker. Today's speaker is Jason Marzak. Mr. Marzak is a senior director at the Atlantic Council's Adrian Arsht um, Latin American Center. He has over 20 years experience working with high level policymakers and private sector executives to shape public policy in areas related to regional economics, politics, and development. He teaches at George Washington University in Washington, D.C., and has testified before the U.S. Senate Committee on Foreign Relations 
and the U.S. House Committee on Foreign Affairs. Um, we're very pleased to have um, him here to kick off our 26th annual Western Hemispheric Trade Conference. Um, he's going to talk about the new U.S. Latin American relationship, where we headed. So let's welcome Mr. Marzak to Tammy Yu and to Laredo. Well, thank you so much. It's uh, wonderful to be able to kick off Tammy's 2022 annual conference as part of the IBC Bank and Commerce Bank Speaker Series. Uh, Dr. Arenas, uh, great to great to uh, thank you for your comments to begin this. And Dr. Clark, thank you as well for your your comments. And I also want to give a thank you to uh, Amy Palacios who put this incredible event together, uh, as well as a thank you to, of course. Uh, uh, by our friends at IBC uh, who had the chance to speak with before this event, look forward to speaking with uh, afterwards as well. It's, it's been a number of years uh, since I've been in Laredo. Uh, I was reminded, I think it's been about 10 years since I've been in Laredo. It doesn't feel like it, but it has been. It's really great to be back. I actually spent part of the afternoon today uh, with a, a colleague from the State Department going to the Columbia and the, and the World Trade Ports of Entry. Uh, really nice to be here when it's uh, 90 degrees when it's uh, much colder back in, in Washington. Uh, but also, and I'm not just saying this because I'm here at TAMU, this is an, incre this is an excellent university. And I uh, always say yes when TAMU asks uh, for me to be a part of something because I fondly recall all the time spent with the incredible staff, faculty, and the incredible students uh, here at, uh, at TAMU, important, most importantly, frankly. Uh, I'm here from Washington, so you can insert your joke here about Washington. Uh, but I will say when people say that, when people say I'm here from Washington and I have the answers, run for the door. Uh, because if you're from Washington, you probably don't have the answers. But instead, I'm here from Washington and I have insight and ideas that I want to share that can help, hopefully help to shape some of your thinking uh, about the region and where we are going. Um, First, to color my remarks, it's important to note that my comments are shaped by the nonpartisan core uh, of the Atlantic Council, where I run, uh, as George said, where I run the Adrian Arst uh, Latin America Center. This is a center that's been the Atlantic Council, a leading global foreign policy think tank around for over 60 years. Adrian Arst Latin America Center, founded in 2013, and founded with a really important idea and principle. I'm so firmly committed to. From finding with that idea that we need to better connect Latin America and the Caribbean to the world community. We have to stop looking at the region just in isolation, just in a prison, but recognize the broader global uh, uh, lessons and opportunities that are coming from the region, and also the regional challenges and what the interplay is with, with the rest of the world. And also to look at the region from a perspective of, of what is possible. It's easy to always think about what is not working, but what is possible and how do we get there? Um, although uh, in, in Washington, uh, differentiating from, from many, there, I, there's no political agenda, but really our agenda is one of working with partners and allies to find solutions to some of our most complex problems and doing so by working with, as George said, working with the public sector, the private sector, and academia. So over the next 40 minutes, uh, I will hopefully tell a few jokes to keep you guys, everyone, everyone uh, 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 focused, but I'm going to tackle what I think is most important to know about the trajectory of Latin America and the Caribbean. First, the region is changing rapidly. Second, also I'll look at China's role, which cannot be understated, China's growing role, growing presence in the region. Uh, also third, the U.S. has many untapped opportunities in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, but those opportunities are both opportunities for the United States. It's also a two-way street. There's also greater opportunities for country in the region to work with the United States. And so then, then a couple of questions come up. How should U.S. policy adapt to a fast-changing Latin America region? What new commercial and diplomatic opportunities may be on the horizon? And also, what's of course, because we're here in Laredo, what's the role of Mexico? What's the role of Mexico in, in, in U.S. strategy moving forward? Uh, and, and, and how can we better tap into those opportunities? Uh, I think for many people here, there's probably no need for convincing, but why, why Latin America and the Caribbean? Why, why, is it, why is the region as a whole so important? And I, I think it's important to color that with the fact that there's so much competing attention right now to global hotspots. Of course, we are all following on a, on a, on a daily basis the uh, uh, atrocities being committed in Ukraine, the Russia's war in Ukraine, 
uh, which is capturing the world's attention. Uh, we also see instability uh, around the world as well. At this moment, it's a moment of profound global transformation, transformation with uh, not only the way that we communicate and how we communicate, the way that political leaders relate to their constituencies, uh, but also when where where the world is thinking about what is, what's the next step as we are emerging from this pandemic and a pandemic that will continue to reverberate insofar as how it shifts thinking, how it shifts economies, how it shifts cultures, uh, and how it shifts bit broader thinking. And it, it's a time in which the status quo is really being up to, upended. So many question, why should we pay attention to a region that's largely peaceful, doesn't threaten U.S. interests and where there is no major crisis. This is what these are. These are some of the reasons why Latin America, the Caribbean, has historically not captured as much attention uh, in Washington. And, and I say that in general, as the world becomes more volatile, as we see uh, a new world order sh taking shape since February 24th that we could never have imagined but we, we will probably see in the next couple of years how, how the war in Ukraine is going to fundamentally reshape the, the world order. As that is happening, it's critical to have economic prosperity and democratic stability close to home. And I think that's more so now than ever, and that shows the added importance of, of, of the region. So is that the future? What, what can we expect to come in the future? We do a lot of futures-oriented work. So the insight I'm going to share it comes from, one, of course, being an observer of the region, but it also comes from working every day with, I work every day with ambassadors from countries all across the region. Jerry and I were talking about some uh, folks we just hosted the Atlantic Council last, last week. Uh, I work closely with foreign government officials. I work with, uh, with senators, Republicans and Democrats, uh, members, uh, House members of the House, Democrats and Republicans. I made sure to say the first one RD, the second one DR. Uh, and also from engaging with officials in the White House, State Department, other branches of the U.S. government, and, and also regularly talking to hosting ministers, heads of state from, from across the region. And so being able to hear both, both sides, being able to hear what folks are saying in Washington, the executive branch, and the Congress, which is different. But then also what I'm hearing consistently from business leaders and from regional heads of, heads of state working with, with companies all across sectors. I'll say that, you know, a couple of months ago, I would have said that what's the biggest issue that's going to affect the trajectory of, of the region writ large. A couple of months ago, I would have said COVID was the, COVID's the biggest issue, right? And how, how leaders continue to respond to, to COVID, uh, how countries emerge from COVID, what type of actions are taken to use COVID, hopefully as an opportunity to leapfrog longstanding development challenges. Um, last year, a, a former Mexican finance minister told me in a meeting that he begins every meeting going through his COVID numbers. Uh, before even looking at GDP numbers or anything, what's your, what's your case count, uh, what, how much, uh, what's your vaccination rate, um, you know, what in the region writ large, although 21 um, percent of cases worldwide and 32 percent of the deaths worldwide, the region had just about eight and a half percent of the world population. Uh, many countries are incredibly proud of what what they've done. Uh, Ecuador, in particular, uh, hosted the the vice president of Ecuador a couple of months ago, and the foreign minister just last week. Uh, and you know, Ecuador in particular was really feeling the brunt of COVID. There were literally bodies on the streets of Quito. They couldn't pick them up fast enough. Uh, new government came into power, and they accelerated uh, the vaccination campaign. Uh, they got their numbers under under control. Uh, they got their sanitary measures in, in place, and so now Ecuador is 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 um, is kind of coming along with the rest of the region. Where you have, uh, as of about a month ago, you have about 63% of the region is fully vaccinated. Countries like Chile that are about 90%. Uh, Argentina, Ecuador, Uruguay numbers in the high 70s. Some of those numbers is a little bit. The Chile numbers in particular, you still have high um, you have high vaccination rates, but you still have high uh, case counts, partly because a lot of the Chile got their vaccines from their Sinopharm and Sinovac vaccines, which have been the, which are the Chinese vaccines, which have been shown to be uh, uh, less effective. But COVID was was the biggest issue. Um, and, and why is why is COVID so so important? I mean, it's it, it's very important from an economy and social perspective. Uh, uh, the the inequality that has always existed in Latin America and the Caribbean was only exacerbated. It was put under a microscope during COVID because the haves could send their kids to uh, school still. 
Uh, they, their kids still get, could get a, an online education. Uh, they could still work from their homes and the have nots couldn't. They, they, they had to go out, they had to go to the markets every day to go to their, 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 um, uh, their, their, their shop to be able to bring home uh, the income that was necessary. Uh, and, and you also started to see at the beginning of the vaccination campaign, well, Latin, Latin America couldn't get vaccines when the U.S. wasn't supplying vaccines and the Chinese were. Uh, a number, basically, people were coming to Miami. They were flying to Miami to get their vac vaccinations, and that was really further accelerating some of the uh, uh, some of the resentment uh, that was seen toward was increasingly growing toward toward the uh, elite during during COVID, uh, as well the the corruption that existed during COVID. A number of health ministers in a couple of different countries uh, lost their uh, positions because of corruption, accelerated corruption because of the need for quick procurement of PPE you know, personal protective equipment, uh, and that being seen as another kind of rife opportunity for for corruption. So these some of these tendencies that you see in many parts of the region were only exactly exacerbated uh, during COVID. And when people say that governments don't, their governments don't respond, their governments don't work for them, well, then it was, it was, it was put on display uh, when, with, with various kind of uh, uh, haphazard measures. It led to an economic contraction in, uh, in 2020 that increased poverty, uh, uh, income inequality uh, in a region where that is already the most unequal region in the world in terms of income. Uh, 22 million people across Latin America moved into poverty. Uh, in, in 2020. And so a lot of the gains that you saw in, in, in people moving out of poverty over the, in the 2010, 2000s, 2010s, uh, a lot of that was, was reversed uh, due to COVID. Uh, also real devastation of small and medium-sized enterprises. A lot of work that we're doing right now is how do we help to reactivate small and medium-sized businesses uh, that have borne, borne the brunt of this. Tourism in particular, uh, we do a lot of work with the with the Caribbean. We have a new Caribbean issue. The Caribbean economies were hit tremendously hard by the drop in tourism numbers. Uh, many Caribbean countries are relying on tourism for upwards of twenty or so percent of their of their GDP, and that doesn't just affect you know sandals or some of those other big resorts, but it, it, it impacts the the small and medium sized businesses that are part of those broader supply chains. And, and a real popular dissatisfaction there really that grew, right? Um, the new president of Peru, Pedro Castillo, he was a, a union leader, uh, student leader, uh, uh, up until becoming president. So not so part of this this new class of political leaders uh, that really doesn't that was that really that doesn't have political experience, but is part of those that class that's really welcomed now uh, by the by the population. He, he kind of ran a campaign that was essentially a. Uh, throw the bums out, right? Let's let's get rid of the old guard because we need we need new new leadership. Uh, so what you did see is you you, you saw this accelerate accelerant of this trend toward toward populism coming on top of an already weakened support for democracy across the region. Uh, regional support for democracy declined by fourteen percent uh, since two thousand ten. So from sixty three percent in two thousand ten uh, to forty nine percent in 2020 that, that think that democracy is the best form of governance, right? That uh, above above and beyond uh, all, all, all else, right? And I think we see some of the reverberations of that with some of the new leaders have come on, especially, you know, Nayib Bukele, the new president of El Salvador, relatively new, a couple of years, uh, who has a number of kind of authoritarian tendencies, but he's super popular. I mean, his popularity is, you know, upwards of 70%. People don't care. They, they just want a leader that they think is delivering for them, uh, and that that has an impact on the on the broader support of of democracy. Um, at the same time, I think the one of the the biggest issues now, from a global perspective, as I mentioned earlier, is how does Latin America navigate this growing split in the world order uh, and these reverberations of the U.S. trying to buy? We we haven't gotten there quite yet. We haven't gotten to see quite yet. What's going, what are the going to be the secondary tertiary implications of U.S. and Europe uh, strategy and a couple of our, you know, Asian and, 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 and Australia, New Zealand, but, our, and, but our, our strategy with regard to Russia right now and essentially isolating Russia from the uh, broader world order is going to eventually lead to a greater split in that world order and, uh, than what we've seen uh, since uh, uh, in, the, in the last in, in, in the in the decades since that we've become used to, and so what is what what does what will become an increased split in the world order, uh, in the way the world economy and the way the global supply chains work? Uh, uh, what does that mean 
for Latin America? What does that mean for our, our own hemisphere? Uh, more in China in a moment, but you know, I think as all, as all of us know that you know, Russia and Ukraine supply about a third of world wheat. Um, at the same time, Latin America is a valuable source for U.S. food, uh, especially produce. Uh, and, that's for, and thus for U.S. food security. Five of the top 20 U.S. food sources are, are, are Latin American countries. And so what, what are, what are going to be some of those implications? What does rising food prices, which we are going to be seeing, which we are already seeing in the United States, we will continue to see in this country, uh, will be seen in Africa, will be seen in the Middle East, but will also be seen in, in Latin America. So what is the impact on ri of rising food prices uh, on countries that are at this point struggling to survive, struggling to come out of the pandemic and where there is a lot of, as I mentioned earlier, this, this, this trend toward populism and, and this trend toward really great polarization and, and misinformation and disinformation that, that's being spread uh, across, across, across the region, as well as the rising oil prices, right? So as you see uh, a couple of weeks ago, it was a, a private conversation, but I hosted a couple of minister, four ministers of Costa Rica and Panama and the Dominican Republic. So I won't say who said this because it was private, but one, somebody said in the room, uh, gosh, if, if uh, oil prices hit $120 a barrel, you know, essentially we're in big trouble uh, because people are going to be out in the streets protesting. And, and because of the constraints on our, our, our fiscal constraints because of COVID, we have no fiscal maneuverability to try to lower those prices or provide other other offsets. And so uh, as we look at right, not only the rising food prices, but also the also the oil prices, what are the implications for the region? What are the implications for social protest in the region, which we saw uh, back in 2019 in, in Chile, Colombia, Guatemala, uh, we saw rise again uh, afterwards. And so uh, uh, how will that impact the popular death satisfaction? And then how does that impact, and I'll get to this in a moment, but then how might this act impact voting uh, as we have major elections this year in, in, in two really important uh, economies? Uh, so I, I think that this is, this is something that's, uh, uh, I focus on a lot is is the gl broader global implications of what's happening and what does that mean for Latin America. But the region is rapidly changing. Uh, it's rapidly changing politically and it's rapidly changing economically. I'll say politically, uh, as I mentioned, this popular dissatisfaction pre-COVID has started to, to swell again as we started to emerge from COVID. We saw that just last summer with the protests in Colombia, uh, uh, streets that were blocked, ports that were blocked, uh, um, and, 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 and this will continue to, to reverberate. And then also politically, we have a new crop of leaders that are increasingly uh, taking the helm across the region. Uh, just last weekend, um, Costa Rica elected a new head of state, head of state uh, Rodrigo Chavez, no, no, uh, no, no family or lineage to Hugo Chavez in Venezuela. It's even spelled with an S rather than a Z at the end. Uh, but, but Rodrigo Chavez, who will be inaugurated as the president of Costa Rica on, on May 8th, and, and that represents a real, uh, it's, a, it's a rupture in Costa Rican politics. I mean, Costa Rica is a country that is really uh, 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 oscillated between two major parties insofar as who has led the country. Rodrigo Chavez is a, is a complete outsider. Uh, he, he was uh, uh, living in Washington, actually. He was a World, World Bank official for, uh, for, for a number of years, had to leave the World Bank under, under some questionable circumstances. Uh, he served as finance minister briefly in the previous, or the current Costa Rican government. Um, but he 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 represents this 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 this. It was a campaign of let's 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 upend Costa Rican politics, right? That it's, it's not working the way the way it should be working. Um, and Honduras as well. <clears throat> Honduras inaugurated a new uh, head of state, Xiomara Castro, at the end of January. Uh, uh, she is uh, the uh, the wife actually of Mel Zelaya. Mel Zelaya. Was uh, th was thrown out of office in, in Honduras by a, um, a, a congressional coup uh, about a, a decade ago. Uh, but CMR Castro um, represents, I think, and I'll get to this in a moment, but a a, a different type of, of of left, a different type of more pragmatic left. And I'll get to this in a moment about these left versus right um, uh, a way that we categorize tend to categorize political leaders. And then it really doesn't make sense to me anymore uh, insofar as those, I think, overly simplistic uh, definitions. Uh, but CMR Castro in Honduras represents a, a huge opportunity for the United States uh, because she came to office with a desire to work more closely with the United States. Her predecessor, 
uh, who is now, uh, who's, who, who was since being extradited to the United States, Juan Romano Hernandez on drug trafficking charges. His, his brother uh, was convicted of drug trafficking charges in New York City, uh, was, um, uh, of, is, it was essentially no friend to the United States. Uh, and as we double down on our work in Central America, Honduras represents and CMR Castro represents an opportunity. I would caution that there is a long history in Honduras. We need to be careful about how much uh, weight we're putting into uh, Honduras kind of being a savior for the, for, the, for the hemisphere. But importantly, she has already gone ahead uh, and invited the UN in uh, for an anti-corruption commission which is a really important development. Guatemala did that, as you might know, um, uh, uh, years ago, uh, back in uh, about 15 years ago. Uh, but corruption is really one of the big uh, challenges, scourges and, and, and impediments to investment uh, in Central America. And, and then there's also a new, a new president in Chile, Gabriel Boric. Uh, he is uh, in, very interesting. He just took office uh, last month. And Boric is uh, also part of this new, potentially a new, a new, a new more, new more pragmatic left. Uh, it also, similar to Costa Rica, upends the political order in Chile. Uh, he is not from the any of the, the traditional coalitions that have governed uh, Chile since the uh, uh, since the Pinochet era. Um, but he also represents what could be a new type of, of, of leader who who is from the left, but is 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 um, has a, a very pragmatic finance minister, so pragmatic on the finances, uh, um, but uh, but 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 tends toward uh, kind of more traditional leftist politics insofar as inclusivity, uh, uh, his outreach to Chile's indigenous population uh, that has historically been left out of Chilean politics. Uh, and so I think this really means this question as we look at kind of how the region is changing, what does this mean about this, this, this way that we overly simplify the left versus the right in the region? Should we even still be using those definitions? I don't think so, because I, don't, I think those definitions are rooted back in the 80s, they're rooted back in the 90s, but they don't really represent uh, the, 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 the new leadership that is taking uh, 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 charge across the region. Um, uh, 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 Nicolas Maduro from Venezuela is on the left, but, but so is Gabriel Boric and is Chile is also from the left. They're, 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 I couldn't, they're two leaders who are diametrically opposed, but they're both people that would be overly simplified as categorized for being from the left. Um, we have some consequential elections this year as well. Uh, Colombia uh, election, the first round of that election will be on uh, May 29th. Uh, actually, I invite all of you uh, promotion. You're all welcome to uh, see and, and happy to share the information. We'll, we will actually, at the Atlantic Council in partnership with Univision, we will be doing the first international foreign policy conversation with Colombian presidential candidates uh, next Tuesday at uh, 5 p.m. Central, 6 p.m. East, 5 p.m. Central, 6 p.m. East. Uh, hosted by Patricia Johnny Oat, uh, who's one of Univision's uh, top inc top anchors, three million Twitter followers. Uh, but that's a very a consequential election. Uh, there, um, the the front runners at this point are a person, uh, uh, Gustavo Petro, uh, who is associated with, who is from the the, the what we would use as the overly simplified left definition, uh, with about thirty six percent in the latest polls, uh, and then uh, Federico Gutierrez. Uh, 24% right behind him. Uh, it, and, and then there's a, a couple other viable candidates, Sergio Fajardo, Rodolfo Hernandez. Um, interestingly, the top runner, this Gustavo Petro, uh, there's a lot of concern about what his presidency could mean. Uh, uh, if he, if some of the traditional ways in which U.S. and Colombia have worked together, if that would continue under a, a Petro uh, uh, presidency, I think it's probably too early to be to, to, to say that. And that's one of the reasons we're going to be uh, hosting Petro and others uh, next Tuesday. Um, and then, uh, but Gustavo Petro served as, as mayor mayor of Bogota. Uh, uh, previously, he actually, under, uh, because of, of some uh, contract questions with, with the waste management, uh, he was uh, relieved from his post, uh, but then eventually reinstated uh, in his post. Uh, and, and, a, and, this, and the second person second in the polls right now, Federico Gutierrez, who used to serve as, as mayor of, uh, of, of Medellin. Colombia will most likely go to a second round, but this is, this is really important. I know we're, we're here in the NATO. Uh, we focus a lot on Mexico. Mexico is very important, but Colombia is, I say, one of our most important, our being the United States, one of the US, U.S.'s most important partners 
in the world. I, I, and I don't just, not just Latin America, I say, I say in the world because the US Columbia security cooperation, uh, 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 intelligence cooperation, and the broad partnership is just, is, is, is profound. Uh, President Duque was uh, just in Washington a couple of weeks ago. Uh, last August, when, we were, when the US was trying to look for who's, who's gonna raise their hand to take in Afghan refugees, uh, Colombia right now has 2 million Venezuelans that's taken in so far. Uh, um, it, it's, it's astronomical, the number of Venezuelans that are coming into Colombia on a daily basis. And, 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 and I'll tell you, Colombia is doing the work of the United States as well, because if those if those Venezuelans were in Colum those two million Venezuelans weren't in Colombia, well, they'd probably be making their way north, and they'd be trying probably making their way to our southwest border. But instead, they're 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 in Colombia, and Colombia actually led the charge um, uh, about a year ago and providing temp temp what we have here temporary protective status TPS uh, for ten years for uh, for these for these Venezuelan migrants and and, and refugees that are fleeing an absolutely horrific situation in their country. Uh, so Colombia uh, is is a real important partner uh, for those for the Venezuelans that Colombia uh, has. They get a fraction of the international assistance uh, that other countries get for say for for example for for Syrians that are that are that are taken. Lots of pledges, but not a lot of money coming in. But the importance of Colombia as well goes back to as I was mentioning uh, uh, last August when we were looking for Afghan refugees. Colombia already has these two million Venezuelans. Colombia raised his hand and they said, "We'll take in Afghans." Colombia, you'll take Afghans. You already have two million Colombians, two million Venezuelans in Colombia. Um, uh, with uh, Colombia also has volunteered to help with you know Ukrainians as well at this point. Uh, uh, when when the U.S. Uh, when when the invasion uh, when Russia invaded Ukraine in, uh, on that on that February the twenty fourth right that Thursday, um, Colombia President Duque made the strongest statement. Of any of any leader in the region, probably one of the strongest statements of any leader in the world outside of outside of Europe, uh, alongside his vice his his vice president, his foreign minister, uh, condemning Russia, saying that he was there with the United States all the way. Colombia is a, a NATO global partner, uh, and Colombia was also recently designated by uh, President Biden when President Duque visited a couple of weeks ago as a major non NATO ally, which means that Colombia gets uh, preferential um, can have access to certain. Um, uh, DOD uh, procurement, uh, U.S. training, and, and other things. Um, so Colombia is a really important U.S. partner on a whole variety of different different reasons. Um, and these elections are going to be May 29th. And and and, and there's a the, the the longstanding way in which we look at the U.S.-Colombia relationship could potentially change if Gustavo Petro comes to comes to comes to office based on some of the things he said thus far. This was conversation is really important next week. Um, you know, he, the, the Colombia has been a really strong partner with the United States on uh, being uh, very strident in, in um, taking all actions to oppose Nicolas Maduro in Venezuela, uh, supporting the opposition in Venezuela, uh, trying to find a resolution to that that political, economic, and humanitarian crisis. Petro might decide to to instead have a much more uh, softer approach with Venezuela to try to find some opportunities for reconciliation. Uh, with Maduro, but that's all, all kind of to, to be determined. Uh, but so this, it's a really important election for a really important partner. And then also this year we have a really important election in, in Brazil uh, in October. Uh, the uh, Jair Bolsonaro, the current Brazil president, uh, is is uh, uh, a front runner alongside Luis Inácio Lula da Silva, otherwise just known as Lula. Uh, latest polling has Lula at about thirty percent, Bolsonaro at twenty three percent. Uh, that will probably also go to a second round, like like Colombia will, um, um, uh, because I, it, it just like it, it, similar to Colombia, if you don't get the outright majority in the first round, you go to a second round vote. Uh, we'll actually be hosting. I'll be hosting. I'll be hosting in my office on uh, Monday. Uh, Ciro Gomes, who is one of the other Brazilian presidential candidates, he's he's polling only polling at two percent right now. Basically, anybody but Lula and Bolsonaro are polling at about two percent, three percent. So it's really it's really them right now. But you know, things can change. We're still, as we know, uh, as we've come to come to realize these last few years, you can't tell the outcome of an election until the people actually vote. So so it, anybody who's in the election could could potentially win. Ciro Gomes is a He's a minister. Of, he was a minister of finance. He was a, a governor of the northeastern state of of, uh, of of Serra. He was a congressman, a mayor, and then another viable candidate right now is somebody named uh, Joao Doria. Joao Doria also polling very low, but a viable candidate. He's the 
uh, uh, he, he was the governor of Sao Paulo uh, uh, state uh, up until a couple of days ago because he had to give up his governorship to run for, for president. But Brazil as well, very important country. And again, yes, we're here in Laredo, we're focused on Mexico, but Brazil is incredibly uh, the largest country in the hemisphere. And is a country where the US partnership with Brazil is totally untapped. You know, the, the relationship between uh, the current Brazilian government, the US government right now is um, uh, maybe at best tense, uh, given the, 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 the differing perspectives. Uh, there's a huge opportunities for uh, uh, cooperation on, um, on a priority for, for this, this U.S. administration, which is climate, uh, and for Brazil, Brazil um, being uh, obviously the, the Amazon rainforest, and Brazil being uh, 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 one of the most biodiverse countries uh, in the world, uh, and really being working together even more so on, in international forums. And, and Brazil is working more closely with the U.S. as being a leader in the global south on issues that are of joint importance to both the US and Brazil. So uh, a lot happening politically. Uh, economically, as I mentioned, the inequality that's been heightened by COVID, but also on the positive front. This is something I, you know, the, I mentioned earlier that I like to focus on the positive as well. Uh, Latin American startups. Doesn't, doesn't People don't think about the startups, you think about Silicon Valley, you think about other places, but according to Crunchbase, which is a leading business information company, Venture capital investors poured a record nearly $20 billion into startups uh, last year in Latin America. That's actually more than triple the amount from 20, uh, 2020. Uh, and, and Latin America is, uh, Crunchbase knows, is, is the fastest growing region in the world for venture funding in 2021. Um, there's also at least 27 known unicorns, uh, companies that have a market value more than uh, a billion dollars, and, and there's um, you know a, a number of different reasons for that. I think one 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 thing behind that is yes, you have these startups that are happening across the region. A lot of a lot of venture capital funding that's going in the region. At the same time, though, what you have is you don't have a lot of government policy that's supporting those venture cap venture capitalists. And so what actually happens is a lot of a lot of them then come to the United States. They go to Silicon Valley or other places across the U.S. to really further their investment. But but it does show the the broader kind of entrepreneurial spirit that exists in the region and the technological capabilities and capacity that exists across the region, which is a huge opportunity for, 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 for investment. Um, at the same time, FDI flows to the region uh, plummeted by nearly half in 2020, but I do expect a lot of those FDI flows to begin to uh, uh, further recover. As well, I think another key issue is the fact that China's rise in the region cannot be understated. And that's, that's really, really important. We think about Latin America and the Caribbean right now. We think about our friends, our partners in this hemisphere. It's, a, it's the, the dynamics in the region are so different than, than a decade ago because of China. Uh, uh, somebody like uh, President Bukele in El Salvador uh, can essentially thumb his nose at the United States because he knows that he's got China as a partner, right? He, El Salvador switched recognition from Taiwan to China a couple of years ago. China has since then, you know, in, uh, poured you know billions of dollars into stadiums and other uh, kind of white elephant projects. Um, um, even even in in a, in a country like uh, uh, Trinidad, for Trinidad and Tobago, uh, you know, tri uh, years ago China helped to refurbish the residence of the prime minister, and so China just it, it, it has the these. These 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 um, increased uh, capacity, increased uh, uh, things that that China is investing in, in different ways that that are not the ways that the U.S. would invest, which are all kind of with this idea of kind of how to, how to curry more favors across the region. The, the Winter Olympics, uh, we saw uh, a number of Latin American leaders going to uh, going to Beijing. Um, uh, uh, President Bolsonaro of Brazil and President Fernandez of Argentina, both actually both. Both leaders first stopped in Moscow in early February, and then they went on to uh, went, went on to uh, to to, uh, to Beijing. Uh, importantly, uh, both have been uh, both Brazil and Argentina have uh, have, have, have been uh, voting with the United States at the United Nations on Ukraine, uh, even though they had this this vote in, in Moscow. But part of that is because of I, I give that that some of. The, 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 the groundswell of support that we've seen in the region for our Ukraine policy, 
I attribute that partly to great U.S. diplomacy. I mean, the U.S. Di U.S. embassies, U.S. ambassadors. It doesn't just happen that these things these things don't just happen. It's it's a lot of phone calls. We need we need greater statements. We need we need you to glean in here. We, this is really important. And so we we see this uh, across the, the region. And my understanding is in Mexico in particular this happened uh, because if you recall on that Thursday, the twenty fourth, uh, the, the foreign secretary Marcelo Ebrard had a statement in the morning that was somewhat weak. And then, and then he had a second statement later in the day, which still wasn't incredibly forceful. It wasn't like the kind of things we're getting from Duque, but it was stronger. And, and that was because, uh, my understanding, because uh, the Ukrainian ambassador and a number of European ambassadors all went to the foreign ministry that day and said, this is not acceptable. Uh, and so the, these statements that we're seeing across the region and, and the support to varying degrees is, is it's, it's, you know, U.S. diplomacy, but it's also, of course, European diplomacy. Um, but China's rise can't be understood. And, and, and China really used this moment of COVID uh, as a opportunity for vaccine diplomacy uh, across the region, especially uh, before the U.S. started to provide vaccine donations to Latin America because the U.S., uh, rightfully wanted to make sure that there were enough vaccines for the U.S. population first. But China took that opportunity uh, to not provide donations. It was a really important difference. The U.S. provided vaccine donations to the region. China sells vaccines to the, to the region uh, and uh, has other had other stipulations as part of those agreements to try to curry uh, longer term, uh, longer term favors. Uh, but this was and the way also really important is the different ways in which the U.S. versus China provides vaccines, has provided vaccines to the region. So China, how does China provide vaccines? China, China sends in a, a plane. The ambassador does a huge media conference, uh, front page of the, of the newspapers, uh, as much fanfare as possible, uh, even for maybe a limited number of vaccines. Um, whereas the United States has provided a large amount of our vaccines through the COVAX vaccine mechanism, which is a you know a global mechanism that basically pools vaccines and then globally decides you know how those vaccines should be allocated, and the U.S. can say, well, we want to give X number to the region, but they still often as will go through, especially early on, will go through through COVAX rather than bilateral donations. Now we've done more and more bilateral donations uh, as time has gone on, but the different way in which those vaccines were provided meant that China got a lot more. Uh, accolades uh, for its vaccines that, that, that the United States did. Um, and then there's also the Belt and Road Initiative. So it's a, an, it's a Belt and Road is initially uh, initially targeted the Indo-Pacific region. It's now expanded to more than uh, 130 countries, uh, amounting to about 40% of global GDP and more than uh, affecting more than 63% of the world's population is essentially uh, Belt and Road's a it's a continuation of this you know the old Silk Road uh, of the hey, of the yesteryears in China uh, infrastructure investments uh, financing for those for those investments uh, in 2017 four years after it was announced uh, China the program was launched excuse me China announced that the Latin America was going to be a natural extension of the Belt and Road Initiative um, and Panama became the first country to join Belt and Road. Uh, and today we now have about 20 countries. Argentina just announced as well that it's, it's joining Belt and Road. And China, Belt and Road is really this, this opportunity for China to, to not only provide for infrastructure financing, infrastructure development. Why is that important for China? Well, it's important for China because China has invested so much in its own infrastructure and development that it needs to find other places for its own companies to invest because uh, otherwise uh, th there aren't those opportunities. As well, it's strategically important for China because they, these these terms all come, these deals all come with other types of terms that are included. Um, and it's about kind of serving I interest too. So, you know, a, a road will be built to get, you know, uh, you know, lithium to port because they want the, they need the lithium in China, right? So the, it, there's all, a, there's all a, a strategic reason for, for the, for the, for the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, trade, but by the way, trade between Latin America and, and, and China grew more than 25 times. Um, um, in the last, um, I think by, by the last 12 years, uh, from a low base of 12 billion, and China's share of total Latin America and Caribbean trade multiplied has multiplied eightfold in just the last uh, the last decades. So this is it's a real and in growing part. China is now the largest trading partner of Brazil, Chile, Peru, and Uruguay, and the second largest for many countries, including uh, including uh, Colombia, where trade with China fell. 
uh, just short of U.S. trade in goods by only $109 million in, in 2020. Um, so th it's, it's a completely different context in the region right now with this growing interest of China. And I, and I, and I, there, there, oftentimes people will group China and Russia together. I, I, I don't do that insofar as the interest. I think China's interests are economic, they're investment interests, they're about um, um, natural resources, they're about commodities, they're, uh, Russia's interest in the region is about, is, it's nefarious activity, right? It's about trying to sow instability, uh, it's about disinformation, misinformation, uh, helping out Nicolas Maduro in Venezuela, helping out Daniel Ortega uh, in, in Nicaragua. But I think what is important if, when, when looking at China is is this this this, ment this this mentality that we have in the United States toward China, which is this kind of us versus them approach. It says you know to leaders in Latin America, whether it's you know economy ministers or or technology ministers or others, and says you know we say don't do business with China. Don't don't take don't don't uh, don't use Huawei. Uh, uh, don't use their um, you know go, don't use Chinese 5G. Uh, don't take Chinese infrastructure inv investments. Um, but then the frustration that you then hear from leaders in, in the region is, well, what are you offering in return? Right? You're saying you're saying don't do business with China, but what do you, but what's the alternative? What do you, what is the U.S. offering? And and that that's and 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 there's there's this this kind of there's this kind of this false dichotomy of either work with the U.S. or work with China. What leaders in the region are saying is, well, they just want their own self-interest. They they're going to work with China because they need Chinese investment. They're going to work with the United States because they need U.S. investment. And, and many will tell me if they have the preference, they would of course prefer to work with the United States, right? That we have a, a common culture uh, with the rest of the region. We have common Western values. Uh, we have 60 million over 60 million Latinos in this country. Uh, we have robust uh, trade and travel and tourism. But it's just a matter of can that, does, does the U.S. investment the countries need actually actually reach them? Uh, and and, and how, do we, how do we allow for greater U.S. investment to actually uh, reach countries? But this, this rise of China, uh, uh, again, it cannot be understated. And it has implications, not just trade, trade and investment, but it has imp implications, as I mentioned earlier, on politics and how leaders can know, especially a country like El Salvador that's so traditionally relied on U.S. foreign assistance, that they have there's other vehicles, there's other alternative vehicles. And, and, and unlike U.S. partnership and U.S. assistance that comes with the very stringent rule of law clauses, very stringent transparency, anti-corruption, uh, you know, that, that, that there's no Foreign Corrupt Practices Act when it comes to Chinese business investment in the region. So how should U.S. policy adapt to a fast-changing uh, Latin America region? Uh, is, is I think one that there's, there's and, and this is not a criticism of, of, of this current administration. It, it's it's for, for decades. There's a, a frustration with U.S. policy, right? That U.S. policy has historically been seen as just very scattershot. There's no coherent, focused policy on what are our long-term deliverables in the region. What are we seeking to achieve? And I think part of that is because our our our, our U.S. policy, because there's there's a uh, there isn't as robust of an infrastructure dedicated to the Western Hemisphere. That infrastructure that exists for for decades focuses on where putting out fl fires, right? It focuses on hot spots in the region. How do how do we help to 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 relieve those those hot spots? Um, this administration came to office uh, with a real focus on Central America, right? A real focus on Northern Central America. Uh, was, you know, it was I think the the only foreign policy cam uh, campaign proposal. Uh, put out on the on the, on the website when uh, of, of Joe Biden running for president was was on Central America. It was one of the, for his first executive orders was on Central America. So this administration came off was really focused on that, but that but but then the world happened. Uh, then then there then there was um, uh, protests in Cuba last July, a presidential assassination in Haiti, uh, an earthquake in Haiti, mass protests in Colombia, uh, uh, and the list goes on and on and on. And so there has been a, a can, there has been a, a focus on Central America, and the vice president has that as part of her mandate. There's many others who have this part of their mandate, um, but 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 there there is a there's a there there the, the the focus has had to broaden beyond beyond Central America. And the problem, the challenge in Central America right now is finding these finding willing heads of state in Northern Central America to work with the United States. I'm, I've, you know, Nayib Bukele in El Salvador, uh, very little intention of of wanting to work with the United States. Um, uh, 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 President Giamete of, of Guatemala, um, somebody who 
uh, I spent maybe an hour and a half with him in his hotel suite in December when he was visiting visiting Washington. Uh, uh, wants to work with the United States, but there's a lot of questions from the United States right now about working with members of his government due to some of the things that are happening with his his attorney general and, and corruption questions that, that swirl around Guatemala. And as I mentioned now, kind of the 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 the, 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 the one of the better hopes right now for the US right now is is, is Honduras with this with this new president. But I, I would caution it about that. I think three key countries, I, I talked about Brazil, uh, I talked about Colombia, but of course Mexico, which is such such a pivotal, pivotal country. I don't need to say this here with all of you here, uh, uh, with the United States, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a relationship that I think has been um, uh, 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 tense at certain times, uh, and, but, but also I think with, with, with our, our new U.S. ambassador to Mexico, Ken Salazar, I was talking with Jerry before and I uh, hosted along with it, the Mexican ambassador just, just two weeks ago. Uh, and I like to host the two of them together when they come to Washington because it's great to see the the, the personal bond and the personal ties between between the two of them, right? Uh, these two ambassadors who really like to work together and really have the uh, broader interests uh, at, at stake. And, and there's there's so many important issues with Mexico right now, of course, border issues, and we can talk more extensively about that. But also, of course, the energy reform that's right now before the uh, the Mexican Congress, which will likely be voted on uh, when this current session of the Mexican Congress ends, before it ends, which is end of April. Um, I understand is AMLO doesn't want to do an extraordinary session around this energy reform. Um, and, and a lot of questions about this reform, what would be the implications? What are the implications for U.S. business? I'm sure all of you have heard of concerns from U.S. business. I've heard concerns about U.S. business, not just insofar as what it means in energy prices, uh, and, and, st and stability, but also what does it mean so far as investing in Mexico and being able to comply with their broader global greenhouse gas emission targets as they are potentially forced to re rely on, on kind of dirtier forms uh, of, of, of energy. Uh, two other big challenges for the United States in the hemisphere remain Venezuela and, and, and Nicaragua. Now the Trump administration spent much more, had a much, a very laser focus on on Venezuela having a, a special uh, on, uh, uh, envoy, uh, Elliot Abrams, who served in that role specifically focused on Venezuela. And that, now we see in the last uh, few weeks, maybe there might be maybe some some changes, right? You might have read about the, the visit of a couple of US officials to, to, to Venezuela a, a couple of weeks ago, um, the, the release of two US prisoners uh, in Venezuela uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but Venezuela, is uh, remains a challenge for the United States, not just because of the migration issue that comes to Colombia, but also all the all the security dynamics that Venezuela presents for the United States: the the illegal gold trade, the guns, the gun smuggling, the narcotics trade, uh, the uh, the 450 Russian Wagner troops that are in Venezuela, uh, the disinformation and misinformation that pervades. Spanish language that then that it's pervades comes out of Venezuela and pervades across the hemisphere, and then also Nicaragua. And as things get worse in Nicaragua, we can expect more more Nicaraguans to leave their country. Many have gone to Panama and Costa Rica that have seen really high numbers of of, of immigrants and uh, from Nicaragua. But I, you can assume that as the situation in Nicaragua continues to deteriorate, and I had a chance just last week to meet with the spouses of two Nicaraguan prominent. Uh, political leaders who have been uh, uh, jailed for quite some time, um, who are each also expecting uh, a further deterioration in the situation in Nicaragua, further clamped down by, by Ortega. But we can see those having reverberations then to the United States and beyond. So what do we do? I, I think it's really important that that we consistently look for these points of synergy. Where do U.S. interests overlap with the interests of countries uh, in the region? And that we really help with deliver, delivering real results and, re, and jobs, real opportunity, people, they're less less about the rhetoric, uh, and, I, and I think that, that sometimes the, um, uh, the 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 promotion of, of democracy, which is really important, uh, is is less resonates a little bit less in the region right now. When people over the region right now, after two years of COVID, they just want their lives to be better. They want to be able to have stability. They want to move back out of poverty again. Political leaders need to de need to deliver real results to people. Um, and we need to also find ways to move from rhetoric toward action on accelerating U.S. investment because China has a real leg up. China has state-owned enterprises. We don't. 
And so how do we accelerate that U.S. investment into the region? How do we use tools like we have, like the U.S. Development Finance Corporation? How do we make that an even uh, stronger institution to be able to provide that financing for uh, for U.S. investments in, in a number of different countries? And, uh, and you know, I'm not just saying this, uh, Dr. Arnes, because I'm here at TAMU, but I think educational extent, extent, exchanges are really uh, important as well. In the 2019-2020 school year, about 1.1 million foreign students at U.S. universities, but from Latin America and the Caribbean, the country that was sending the most students was number nine, in the, which is number nine on the list, was Brazil, with only 1.6%. Of, uh, of students at U.S. universities being from Brazil. And Mexico is even after that. Mexico is 1.3% uh, of uh, students at universities were from Mexico. Uh, China, uh, highest on the list, I think 35%. I think India is number two at 18%. But educational exchanges uh, are, are vital because uh, those, those the, the people that come here to get educated in the United States then become business leaders in their countries. They might become a governor, they might become a mayor, they might become a head of state, and they have that relationship, they have that affinity to their U.S. university, to the U.S. city that they were in, the U.S. state, but also to the United States overall, and they understand they're, during their most formative years, they were part of this country, and they're part of the social fabric of this country, and they go back to their country, and that further cements some of those ties. And I will tell you, uh, China is working on this. China, I've seen over the last 10 years, the, 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 the quality of Chinese diplomats skyrocketing. 10 years ago, Chinese diplomats could barely speak Spanish. Now they speak incredible Spanish. They're emulating US uh, uh, exchange programs. They're, they're trying to provide military um, uh, training similar to what US Southern Command does uh, with, with, uh, with militaries across the region. So it's, it becomes even, there's an even more, even greater impetus for these educational exchanges uh, as we see uh, this increased growth of, of China. Um, what does it mean for U.S. policy? It means we have to expand the agenda also from U.S. policy beyond those issues that are of solely domestic importance. This is one, one of the big challenges with Latin America is our foreign policy toward Latin America is oftentimes it's not foreign policy. It's domestic policy, but it's domestic policy that then is uh, 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 portrayed in Latin America, right? Are, 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 are historically the issues that are of most importance for U.S. policy in Latin America are Cuba and migration issues. And, uh, and, 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 and that is a reflection of domestic policy, not necessarily a reflection of what is our broad, biggest foreign policy interest and biggest foreign policy opportunity and biggest economic opportunities. Um, I think it's also important that we bring in additional members of Congress beyond those um, who, beyond the traditional players who really focus on the region. A number of, you all work with the many excellent members of Congress from Texas who think, th you know, thank God that they're, they are so invested in the region, right? And, uh, and, 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 and Florida as well. Uh, but we need to expand beyond, uh, beyond the, the Texas, Florida delegations and others to show the importance because Mexico is you know the number one or number two trading partner with pretty much every every single state in this country, and we need to show the the broader importance of the region uh, across this country. Uh, Latin America also is as I mentioned is increasingly important as as touch points for global issues, whether it's Russia, whether it's China, or whether it's uh, supply chains uh, as well. So what what new and I'll. I'll, uh, Jordan, I'll, I'm going I'm to finish up here. I, I, so what new commercial and diplomatic opportunities may be on the horizon? Well, one opportunity that's on the horizon is, is the uh, huge opportunity to summit of the Americas. And that's a convening every three or four years between all the uh, heads of state and government from across the region. The first one was in 1994 in Miami uh, when Bill Clinton proposed a free trade area of the Americas. It's the first time the U.S. is hosting the summit of the Americas since 1994. We're hosting it in Los Angeles uh, in June. And, and this is a real opportunity to um, bring the hemisphere together on issues of common concern, common, uh, common identification, common value. Uh, I'm, I'm excited that President Lopez Obrador, who normally doesn't travel, doesn't leave Mexico, that he has said that he will come to, to Los Angeles uh, for, this, for this summit. Uh, it's a real opportunity. Um, the agenda right now is looking at everything from green growth to digitalization to climate. I can answer a lot more questions about this. I'm very... We're very involved. We actually have a, 
uh, a partnership with the State Department where we're doing a number of, of virtual roundtables with civil society, private sector, and government leaders from all across the hemisphere, where we're trying to galvanize uh, greater buy-in to the broader ideas of what could come out of this uh, convening. Uh, one of the things that I'm very committed to is not just the convening itself, but one of the criticisms of this process since 1994 is that the heads of state come together and then nothing happens. Right? They, they come up with this nice declaration and there's no action. So how do, what kind of action, and I know my conversations with the U.S. administration, there is a real focus as the U.S. is being the host and will be the host for another year after the summit. And what kind of actual action, tangible action comes out of it? Uh, but it's also, it's a real opportunity. It's also a real, it's, it, it, it's a real um, potential challenge if, if this summit doesn't come off well, right? If we don't deliver the right results, if heads of state from across the region don't all show up in Los Angeles, and there are some sticky issues that have to be worked through, uh, Venezuela in particular. Uh, is Juan Guaido invited? Well, if Juan Guaido is invited, some countries might not come, but could the U.S. invite Nicolas Maduro to Los Angeles? That becomes really challenging politically to, to invite uh, uh, Nicolas Maduro. So there, there is some, uh, what happens, does Daniel Ortega get an invitation in, in Nicaragua? So there's a, a lot of those questions that could then color the, the, the overall participation in the summit, but a real opportunity for the U.S. to leave. The U.S. also has incredible untapped opportunities for, for nearshoring. And this is why you know, I was excited to be today, go to the, the World Trade and the Columbia ports of entry uh, with a, a, a friend of mine back in the audience here from, from State Department, from International Codex and Law Enforcement. Mitch, great, you can, you can make it too. Um, and, and, and the huge opportunities for, for nearshoring, and it, it's, but it's, it's, a, it's a two-way street, right? And I think that what, what the war in Ukraine and what this, what this, global, what this reorientation we're gonna to start to see of global supply chains means is that the U.S.-Mexico trade and commerce, while it's always been fundamental and super you know, critical to U.S. competitiveness, it's going to become more more important by exponential terms as we look at how we reorder the way in which the the, the world is is trading and the way that supply chains are, are working. Um, UBS had a survey two years ago uh, that the financial services company that found that 71 percent of manufacturers had planned to move some of their production out of China. Um, I, I had a meeting a couple of weeks ago with a major U.S. technology company that told me that they were planning on moving all of their um, their, their their factories out of out of China into Mexico. They were looking at how do they recreate some of the infrastructure, some of the educational opportunities. So this this the the, the COVID rethinking of supply chains combined with what's happening in in Europe right now has this opportunity for nearshoring, and it's a matter of how then we do, do we appropriately take advantage of it because if we don't use this opportunity right now, it's gonna pass. Companies are gonna look for other places to invest. Uh, and it's not just Mexico, they're looking, you know, how do we take, we have more free trade partners in Latin America 12 than we have in anywhere else in the, in the hemisphere. So how do we use the fact that we have all these trade agreements, none of which really talk to each other. So how do we really, what, what opportunities could there, could there be to link up some of these different trade agreements so that yes, we don't, we're not we don't necessarily have the money from the United States to invest like China can, but we have the, 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 the tariff opportunities, the duty-free status that the trade agreements present uh, that we can allow for countries to trade more with us and among each other as part of a broader broader network. I mentioned the DFC, importance of DFC investment. Also, I think that nearshoring is one of the few issues uh, in Washington that really has bipartisan consensus. You know, I testified in January before the House Western Hemisphere Subcommittee. Both the chairman and the ranking member Republican and Democrat were both totally in lockstep about the importance of nearshoring and the importance of how, what can the U.S. go do, what can the U.S. government do to greater facilitate that. But at the same time, it's a two-way street. You need to address issues of corruption and rule of law. Uh, Mexico. Let me end with Mexico. Um, I think Mexico is a is a partnership that is getting even stronger. Uh, mentioned I was talking to, to Jerry beforehand about the number of, of Mexican governors that. We at the Atlantic Council have hosted just just the last few months. The uh, Governor uh, Fayada Hidalgo, Governor Morada of Oaxaca, Governor uh, uh, Durazo of, of Sonora. Many governors are increasingly coming to Washington, coming across the U.S. because they see opportunities for their individual states. Because it's, it's a relationship uh, that, of course, you all see here in Laredo, but but that governors are trying to extend far beyond uh, the, the border region as as well. Um, the 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 other uh, I think opportunity is this is the North American Leader Summit that occurred last November. 
uh, this is the first time that the, the, the three amigos uh, that uh, came together in, in five years. And there were a number of really important things that were agreed to as part of the outputs of that North American Leader Summit. Uh, a trilateral supply chain coordination mechanism, uh, a regional compact on migration and protection, uh, how to improve capacity to identify human trafficking and, and other crimes and create a trilateral migrant smuggling human trafficking task force. I know my conversations just with Ambassador Salazar a couple of weeks ago is that these things, things are these things are now moving forward. They're starting to take action. Uh, and also this idea of how do we re-envision and update uh, NAPAPI, the, the 2012 North American pandemic plan for pa uh, animal and pandemic influenza that was shown to be wholly insufficient during during uh, during COVID. But I think in order to fur fully maximize the commercial opportunities between the US and Mexico moving forward, What's going to be critical as well is how do we put is putting in place those mechanisms so that essential industries are not disrupted in the case of future pandemics and future shocks because as all of you saw the the disruptions in those industries cost business uh, 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 it cost business it costs GDP it costs it costs jobs as as well uh, and so this is this is a opportunity that the leaders will come together again in Mexico uh, in November uh, of this year. Uh, but this commitment from all three to really re-envision uh, what the North America could, could mean uh, presents us this incredible opportunity. We can go into in the, in the Q&A later, because you, you all are following this pretty closely as well, what the uh, expiration of Title 42 uh, means from a, a human perspective and what we can see and what we could expect in so far as uh, surges of, of, of unauthorized uh, at the border and 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 how do we, how do, how do, how do, how does that situ, how does that dynamic allow us to also maintain the importance of, as, as you see here in Laredo, is the border is a, is a commercial opportunity. And the border is, is, is oftentimes, I think, seen across the United States. The border is oftentimes seen as, as, a, as a problem, as a threat, rather than the border being an opportunity uh, and an opportunity for, um, for greater integration between the U.S. and Mexico, uh, the, the, the safe and secure, uh, but also helps to accelerate U.S. U.S. business, U.S. jobs, and and uh, and and protects U.S. consumers and, and U.S. employers uh, from those global shocks, given that robustness of the U.S. Mexico trade. So I'm going to end with that, uh, uh, George. I invite all of your questions and and thank you all for taking the time and listen to listen to me. Thank you. mic on. Thank you very much for that. Um, it's been an excellent talk. We've really enjoyed it. Um, so we're now going to take questions from the audience. Um, if you're online, um, if you can type them into the, in, in, into the Q&A session, then um, we can ask, uh, I can ask them on your behalf. If you're here, please stick up your hand and um, one of our student workers will bring you a microphone so that we can hear you and so that the people online can hear you. Sir, <clears throat> years back, there was a problem with the infrastructure in Mexico concerning the petroleum industry. How is that going? Are they developing the pipelines, the transportation facilities, the refining facilities so that they can use or we could have access to their resources like we did in World War II? Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that question. George, would you like me to take uh, questions one by one or? Uh, Just go. Yeah, yeah, we'll do the questions okay. one by one. Yeah. So, so um, th thank you, thank you so much for that question. I, I think that the the, the petroleum industry in, um, has been, frankly, one one of the priorities of President Lopez Obrador since he, he came came to office, right? And one of one of his priorities has been uh, essentially reinvigorating uh, a lot of the, the fossil fuel uh, industry in in Mexico, um, and putting in putting in place uh, new measures to. Uh, 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 make make Mexico make energy make ener Mexican energy independence Mex energy nationalism so it's so full core to I think uh, what AMLO sees as uh, as fundamental to Mexico he sees you know thinks he thinks about you know Las Cardenas in 1929 and the nationalization of the Mexican energy industry and so for him that the petroleum industry the future of the petroleum is 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 fundamental I think that there has been a lot of concern by uh, U.S. energy companies. Um, many energy companies that I'm sure many of you talked to, that I talked to as well, uh, about some of the uh, some of the, the, the some of the, the the stipulations and the way that he is 
tweaking that tweaking the petroleum industry, uh, some of the contracts uh, for exploration that have been put on hold uh, that were uh, agreed to in the in the previous administration for deep different uh, deep water uh, offshore blocks, uh, as well as um, as well as the ability. Uh, for some U.S. energy companies uh, to have uh, to expand some of their their gas stations and other interests in Mexico, and do so in a way that um, that that doesn't necessarily have to involve as much Pemex uh, uh, cooperation. And this has been one of the one of the concerns from the U.S. industry is the degree to which uh, M, the President Lopez Obrador wants to see Pemex involved in you know ev all things energy related. Uh, Pemex isn't necessarily always the uh, the most efficient partner, uh, but this is um, Pemex and and the and its future, and, and this is kind of all clouded so far as part of the broader energy reform that's currently before the Mexican Congress. These are all issues uh, that are fundamental, to, as I mentioned, you know, fundamental to, to President Lopez Obrador, and also um, something that he he is seeking to see to find a way to in his in his idea kind of. Re reinvigorate, rejuvenate the Mexican uh, uh, petroleum industry for the long term, which um, you know, uh, which you know ha has these broader concerns and so far as is the way that he is thinking about the future of the industry uh, as efficient as it should be, and does it provide the, um, the 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 cheapest, most reliable, most efficient, and cleanest fuel sources that many U.S. investors are looking for? Do you think it's working? Do I think it's working? Um, I think I, I think that um, uh, I think that many U.S. companies are uh, second guessing their investments in Mexico because of uh, some of the energy uh, uh, actions that President Lopez or has either taken or is or or is thinking about taking. Thank you. So w once again, if you're in the room, just put up your hand and they'll bring a microphone to you and you can ask questions. If you're online, please type it into the Q&A session and I will read your questions to uh, Mr. Marzak. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I mean, this is a, gosh, there's so much information, so many questions to ask. Uh, for those of us that have that are been around a little bit longer than, than many of the students here, we could recall that Latin America, the powerhouses of Latin America, were countries like Chile, Argentina, Venezuela, uh, Brazil, of course, and Mexico was probably, you know, fourth along the line. This is pre pre NAFTA. Uh, what happened to those great powers? And is it is it been at the cost of of their democracies uh, changing? Are we at risk? Of, uh, of perhaps even a Mexico uh, falling into that trap again? That's a question that keeps popping up in some of our minds in regards to the, the policies that may have gone from one extreme to the other in the course of history. Uh, but, you know, Venezuela used to be a, a big powerhouse. Mm -hmm. Argentina used to be a big powerhouse. And uh, look at where they are now. Could, could Mexico fall a victim of that similar scenario? Jerry, that's a, that's that's a that's a great question. I saw you writing writing in, uh, notes as I as I was speaking as well. Um, you know, I, I, so a short answer to your question is I, I don't see that I don't see Mexico going the route of uh, of, of of Venezuela, uh, Argentina uh, for a number of reasons. I'll explain. I think what is I think first of all you have to think of Venezuela as a little bit of an of an outlier. Right, because you know Venezuela is a um, it's a it's a it's a petroleum state, uh, world's largest proven oil reserves, uh, and it's a victim of, of those oil reserves. Uh, and 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 I think that that what we have seen happen in Venezuela since uh, Hugo Chavez first came to power in 1998 is a reflection of oil. He, he, he could never have come to power. He could never have been as, success, as successful as he was in the early 2000s if it wasn't for oil. The largesse in the Venice, Venezuelan coffers that allowed him to have these robust social programs uh, that, um, that were essentially meant to curry kind of 
political favor uh, and then use the favor that was curried by those programs to then assert his own authoritarian uh, tendencies and clamp down freedom of the press and, and all those things. Um, so I, I think that that, 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 that that the resource curse has really Im impacted Venezuela and even Chavez's rise to power um, was a reflection of the inequality, the, the vast inequality, because Venezuela, as you say, here, Venezuela was the was for years the most the model for the best democracy in all of Latin America. If you, if you for, yeah, as you, for students who are looking at the Venezuela of the last you know twenty some odd years, you think Venezuela democracy, but no, it was a model for democracy in the fifties, sixties, and and but 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 it was a democracy where the benefits only stayed with a small group, it stayed with the elite, and that popular dissatisfaction. Uh, Hugo Chavez, when he first uh, tried to uh, grab power in the early 90s, he, he as, a, as a military officer, you know, he had the support because people were frustrated. They were frustrated with oil wealth only going to a certain segment of the population. So I, I think that the resource curse of Venezuela uh, has has perpetuated this uh, this kind of the situation in which in which is currently in, and and, and you know, and, and Argentina. Um, you know, um, you know, uh, you know. It's it's it's. I was, I was stop stopping for a moment because I was trying to think of a of a joke in Argentina, but it didn't it didn't come to me. I'll come to me later. Uh, but there are there are a number. Um, but it, it has it, Argentina has uh, a lot of wealth, uh, a lot of natural resource wealth uh, uh, through the through Vaca Muerta. Um, it has uh, uh, one of the highly educated population. But it has a very challenging political situation that kind of oscillates back and forth with with this ten trend toward populism in Argentina, right? That goes back to you know Juan Perón in the 1940s, right? So this populism that has very much been a part of Argentine politics, you know, for for decades has has been one of the biggest debilitating factors uh, for Argentina, and why you see again Argentina. Uh, you know, a new IMF loan agreement uh, inked, you know, just a few weeks ago. Um, you know, Chile is still, uh, I think, a successful country, but, you know, but a po po popular dissatisfaction, which is why you have a new type of leader. And, and, and you know, I think in, in Brazil, um, uh, you know, uh, Brazil, you know, is, do, does, is doing relatively well, but the Brazil is still kind of a lot of untapped opportunities, a lot of untapped. We don't have a free trade agreement with Brazil. Brazil uh, is kind of held shackles to, to Mercosur. So I, I don't, I, I think that what we have to, what, 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 with, the, with Mexico, because of the reliance of the United, Mexico's reliance on the United States for its own economy, its own trade, that gives the U.S. a certain level of ability to persuade in Mexico that we don't have another country, even the energy reform right now, right? Um, because it's Mexico, you know, we do have U.S. officials, Secretary Granholm, uh, 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 Secretary Raimundo, of the, uh, others who have been traveling to Mexico and talking to uh, President Lopez over or those around him to try to tweak the reform in some ways to have it a little bit more palatable for, for U.S. interests. But I do think that Unless we um, hit the opportunities to reduce inequality, as inequality grows, so will frustration, and uh, so will popular discontent, and that there there is this this pushback against the political system uh, that you have to be mindful of. Whether we're looking at Mexico, whether we're looking at the United States, whether we're looking at any country in the world, um, and 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 I think that as Everybody is now their own journalist. There, there are there are journalists, there are newspapers, but every each one of you, we have, you know, uh, you know, between people here and online, I don't know, hundred or so different journalists who are watching this right now, and, and so and so th it means that 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 people's frustration is easily uh, easily shared, um, and without without any kind of a, of a filter, and so so it means that that kind of some of this popular dissatisfaction that might have been. Uh, held back, it might have been smaller circles in the past, can really, really pervade. So it makes it all the more urgent, in my opinion, to really address some of these longstanding challenges, inequalities, other things, these gaps between the haves and the have-nots that if left unattended will continue to uh, uh, have reverberations that we've yet to probably see. Sorry, Jerry, a longer answer for your question, but it was a really, really good question. 
Thank you. I'll take a couple of the online questions now, um, and then we'll come back to in, in person. So we have a question from Philippe Duran, and he says, um, you know, due to quarantine and the pandemic all over the world, how has this affected the infrastructure of, uh, in countries in Latin America, and how has it affected trade in these countries as, as well? So, so, so the so quarantine, so COVID um, has, sorry, infrastructure and trade. So, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, as I mentioned, you know, poverty decreased the region, GDP decreased the region. Uh, um, especially in, in 2019, 2020, we've seen that that reverberating again on the upswing uh, for 2022. Um, I think less about kind of the infrastructure. It's like the when you think about infrastructure, you think about the oftentimes you think about roads built, roads, uh, bridges, ports, airports. Uh, but I think what the pandemic has shown is is the is the need to accelerate the region's digital infrastructure uh, because that was um, wholly uh, uh, out uh, out of sync with what was what should have been possible in the midst of the pandemic, right? We, you know, um, uh, students, as I mentioned earlier, they, they couldn't access classes, uh, teachers they couldn't get online. The private universities uh, had the universe had the infrastructure had the broadband for their students to uh, be able to uh, do class online or for or for teachers. But you know, the public universities, uh, schools, and rural communities. Uh, just don't have that kind of that, the digital infrastructure that's, that's necessary. I, I think also on the infrastructure perspective, one thing that hopefully the the pandemic can allow for is this growth in telehealth and telemedicine, and this this could be a real opportunity in the region uh, because what you have is you have this big gap between the type of medical services that are available in the capital cities versus the medical services that are available in smaller villages and, and, and less well-off towns. Uh, and so that, that, that goes back to my argument about the need to, to bridge some of these different inequalities. As you have better digital infrastructure that could, and there's a real focus on, on how do we better develop this digital infrastructure, that, that can, it can erase those, those health barriers uh, that exist in the region for, for quite some time. Uh, on, the, on the trade front, um, the, uh, I mean, economy slowed, so the, so trade decreased. Trade decreased across the region. Uh, intra-regional trade decreased. Uh, Inter-regional uh, inter trade decreased. Uh, but I think that if we look at how do we best take advantage of, the, of what's coming out of COVID, Nearshoring again, or, or sometimes people refer to it as friend shoring now, or ally shoring. All, all three diff different definitions. That has an opportunity to really accelerate trade, not just trade in goods, but also trade in services. Um, and and the service trade, I think, is is a real opportunity in the in the region. Um, uh, whether we, uh, especially looking at like the English speaking Caribbean and what that can provide for the United States. Thank you. And then the next question is from K B Sanchez and. She wants to ask about current inflation, food and water. And in particular, she noted that many people in border towns are crossing into Mexico to get groceries because it's cheaper. How has it affected the countries in Latin America? And is this is, is her perception correct for the region as a whole? Well, I think I think that that in, inflation is a very big concern for for the region. Um, there isn't the fiscal maneuverability. A lot of the, a lot of the excess fiscal resources have been spent during the height of COVID. Uh, Brazil, in particular, had launched a number of different social programs to provide for uh, relief in the, in the in the height of the pandemic. Uh, and and as we see U.S. interest rates increase, those have reverberations. Uh, in Latin, not just of course here in the United States, but those have incredible reverberations in Latin America, probably even greater reverberations because there's less fiscal space to be able to maneuver with those higher uh, interest rates across the region. And, and then, the, and then you know, food and food prices, I mentioned that earlier and the, and the, and the, the, the pressure that's being placed on global food prices. But you know, water as well. Um, water, as we look at the implications of climate change uh, across the region, there are certain countries in Latin America that are especially prone to the impacts of climate change. Of course, the Caribbean with rising sea levels, potentially destroying econ destroying the tourism economy. Uh, you don't have the nice beaches in, uh, to, to go to, so you're gonna go somewhere else. And countries that are wholly reliant upon that, that, that tourism. Um, but also, uh, 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 what lakes drying up, uh, other so less kind of an imp implication of, of COVID itself, 
well, more of an impl implication of, of climate change and what does that mean for uh, water supply uh, across the region? And what does that mean, especially for economies that are so dependent upon uh, it's kind of steady rainfall, like like Guatemala and its coffee crop, and and as you have those, as you have the the, the uh, kind of scarcer water resources, what are the, the that has implications for agriculture dependent economies, and as those agriculture dependent economies feel that that additional pressure, well then people are going to move, and you're going to have a great a gr additional pressure, additional migratory pressure, both within the country but also migratory pressure toward the United States. Thank you. I think we have time for at least one more question from the audience. If you, someone, I, I, I noticed somebody raised their hand. Oh. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, very interesting information. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, there's a lot of information, like Mr. Schwebel said. Uh, I also back. Uh, I'm a, a banker at IBC. Uh, my question is about what do you what do you know or wh uh, where do you see the TPP, the Trans-Pacific mm -hmm. uh, uh, Trade Agreement, and now that you're mentioning that uh, Central America is vital uh, and the U.S. doesn't have the, the Panama Channel because uh, where do you see that uh, importance of, of the TPP since Mexico has a uh, tendency to, to, to do that agreement with, uh, with China yeah. and the U.S. doesn't? Well, I'll say my, my, um, my, 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 uh, my, my personal perspective on TPP is I, I think we, we, we lost an opportunity um, uh, at, at, at the time. I, I think there's no, uh, there's no, um, it, it, it was, you know, a, a mechanism to try to counter some of the Chinese, uh, is, all, is uh, as many of you know, the, the Chinese uh, inroads across the, across the world. Um, I, I don't see, there, there is no appetite I think right now for new trade agreements, uh, so I don't see any I don't see any opportunity on the horizon for the U.S. to try to resurrect TPP uh, or, frankly, um, to strike any kind of new trade agreement. I think there's an opportunity. I think there's more interest right now in kind of how to how to, maybe how to current agreements work a little bit better, and also how do we how how to make sure that things like the USMCA and ha that has the strict uh, labor laws and 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 and, and other compliance mechanisms make sure that those agreements are, are being ad adhered to, but I do think that there is, as I said, uh, there's a real opportunity rather than striking a new trade accord, but a real opportunity to find what could be those points of harmonization among the many different trade agreements that the, sp the traditionally referred to. Uh, spaghetti bowl of trade agreements that we have, where each one is different from the other one. And now we have a new gold standard. Now we have the USMCA. So, you know, is there an opportunity for countries to, to dock on to parts of USMCA because that has, you know, strong bipartisan support? Um, and and, and I, I think as well, you know, there, there's, you know, increased interest from Europe as well on trade with the region. I think uh, there's a, a still, you know, after 20 years, the European Union and Mercosur finally uh, signed a, a trade, uh, agreed to a trade agreement. Now, uh, a lot of challenges with um, President Macron in France and President Bolsonaro in Brazil on climate issues, seeing an, a different, different, different perspectives there. And so that's repeated the that deal from moving forward. Um, but I, I, I don't see TPP as moving forward right now. But I, I do see an interest in how do we nearshore, how do we make supply chains work better. And a real interest in thinking about how do we, from Washington, how do we move this rhetoric into actual reality? Thank you. I think if, if there's any other questions from the audience, I think we have questions for, for one from one more person. And and then unfortunately, that's uh, about our time. We'll be we'll we'll be up at that point. So. Um, um, yes. Do you see China leveraging its? Um, uh, investment in Latin America as a means to expand its military presence or purely economical? It, it's, a, it's a great question. I think there's, there's different, lots of different perspectives on that. Um, so I see China is, is leveraging its, in, its investment. I, I see Chinese military insofar as using the Chinese military to protect Chinese investments. Right, and and I don't I don't see a uh, a, a desire for you know um, 
you know, uh, uh, ch uh, Chinese military ports in the in, in in Latin America or you know bases. And frankly, the U.S. would never allow uh, a country in the region. We'd use all of the tools of diplomacy before China ever has a, 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 a you know a Chinese troops in, in in the region. I think that uh, uh, no country would ever move that forward. But I, 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 there has been uh, concerns, especially with um, protection of. Of, uh, of, of of fishermen off of Ecuador's coast uh, that are being you know harassed by Chinese boats. Uh, you, you do see um, Chinese military is making uh, visits to you know Chinese ships making visits to Latin American ports that you didn't see uh, years ago. Um, but I don't see any kind of long term uh, uh, kind of uh, standing military presence. Uh, but I do see this, as I mentioned earlier, this, this, this tendency of China to really figure out how it can always one step, take one step past, one step before the United States, right? Uh, that you, sometimes what you'll see is when a high level official from the United States visits uh, Latin America, that oftentimes the, the Chinese will be right there as well. And so I think what we do need to do is we do need to ramp up our own diplomacy in the region. We do need to have... Um, um, more, you know, phone calls between uh, visits between U.S. leaders and and Latin American leaders. I, I think we need more. We, not all Caribbean islands have embassies. Uh, some some of the smaller islands have an embassy. In another island that has a broader jurisdiction. China does have those embassies. So I think we need to really increase our diplomatic presence in the region. Um, you know, there is. I know there is now a position. You know, in the state, but there's someone in the State Department in the Western Hemisphere Bureau's Affairs Bureau, uh, whose job is to look at uh, China's role in the region, right? And so we're we're starting to uh, get up to speed on that from a from a government perspective. Um, but uh, I, I only see, you know, China increasing its presence in the region, and and the countries in the region being in this difficult position. Of who to work with, right? As I said, you know, they they want to work with the United States. They prefer to work with the United States, but the United States just has to provide the incentives and the opportunities uh, to be able to, uh, to to do so. Thank you very much. Um, before you all leave, I'd like to um, thank everybody who has made this event possible. Um, Firstly, I'd like to thank IBC and Commerce Banks again for their generous support of the lecture series. I'd also like to um, thank Amy Palacios, um, the Associate Director of the Center for, for the Study of Western Hemispheric Trade, who manages this event and, and the rest of the conference. Um, so it's a very busy time for her. Um, I want to thank all the staff in the School of Business who are here at the back helping us out, and also um, the, deans, the students from the Dean's Student Advisory Council who are here handing out microphones and, 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 and helping us with all these events. And of course, I want to thank OIT for ha um, helping us keep this um, online and in person. Um, we had over 150 people here watching this on, on online, so, um, and to event services for, for, for helping us. So thank you all, and finally, thank you for, to Mr. Marzak for an excellent talk. And we have a little uh, gift for you underneath the podium that, that, I, that I'll come and give you in a second. But. Okay. Well, again, again thank, you for the, uh, thank you for the invitation. A real pleasure to, to talk to all of you. Look forward to talk with you further after the program. And, and, and any, any opportunity to come to beautiful Laredo, it's a pleasure for me. So thank you all for your time.